Hey guys, welcome to Grad Coach TV, where we demystify and simplify the oftentimes confusing world of academic research. My name's David, and today I'm chatting to one of our trusted coaches, Karen, about five of the common mistakes we see students make when they are creating and running a survey. This discussion is based on one of the many articles over at the Grad Coach blog. So if you'd like to find out more information about surveys, visit the blog at www.gradcoach.com forward slash blog. Also, if you're looking for a helping hand with your dissertation, thesis, or research project, be sure to check out our one-on-one -on -one private coaching service, where one of our friendly coaches will help you step-by-step -step through the research journey. To find out more and to book a free consultation with one of our friendly coaches, head over to gradcoach.com. Hey, Karen, welcome to the Coachcast. It's absolutely great to have you here. Thank you, David. It's great to be here. So today we're talking about survey mistakes. And the first one is kind of a biggie. It's having poor structure, design, and flow of your survey overall. So Karen, what are the things we should look to avoid when designing our survey? Absolutely. Poor structure and design of a survey is something that we see all the time because quite often people don't really consider how, how tricky it is to, in the beginning stages, to actually get a really good survey at the end of the day. Mm. But fundamentally, there are some things to bear in mind when it comes to designing the survey. The first and the most important thing is that your survey is there to answer your research questions and objectives mm. and aims, your golden thread, so to speak. And if it doesn't do that, <laughs> then you've got a bit of a problem. Um, yeah. Fundamentally, one way to think about, does my survey actually do this, is to ask yourself, if I had to unpack my objectives and my research question and find out the constructs or the ideas that I am trying to ask in these, um, in these aims, in these objectives, what are they? And a good example of that is, for instance, having job satisfaction in your question, in your research question. That means that you have to ask a set of questions around job satisfaction and, and sometimes people don't you know um and it's 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 often because we read the literature we overthink the data that we're collecting and we get confused because the literature is talking about all of these other things mm -hmm. like intention to leave employee well-being and so we start getting a bit distracted and we start asking all these other kinds of questions and at the end of the day your primary dependent variable whatever is not actually being asked in your survey mm. so try to make sure that once you've designed your survey go back and ask yourself does this actually do what i wanted it to do originally a good way of also thinking about your survey design and your structure is to also think about your respondents at the end of the day they are coming mm in and giving you their time and their energy and their capacity and you want to make it a relatively pleasurable easy experience so that they complete your survey from start to finish you don't want them dropping out of your survey because you know it was too lengthy it wasn't very well considered or maybe the questions were just too confusing so definitely bear your respondents in mind at the end of the day a good structure will often include to begin with your any exclusion questions so any yeah. questions <laughs> which which you really want to ask at the beginning um if for instance your survey is designed to talk to women or to ask women questions have a gender or a sex-based question right at the beginning so that people don't waste their time if mm -hmm. they don't fit into the demographics that that you're actually interested in. So exclusion question first is a really good start. Often that would be followed by your constructs, those ideas that you have to measure in mm. the context of your research. Having sometimes little sets of questions together is not a bad idea, but that is forming the bulk in the middle of your survey. And this is often followed by your demographics questions. So questions related to gender, race, age, maybe the institution that people are with or the kind of sector that they're employed in, if that's an angle of your research. So those kinds of questions will go last. And the reason that they often go last is because they can make people overthink their own mm. identity, if you will, when answering the other questions. So rather keep that to the last section. Fundamentally, however, your 
your survey has to be designed based on principles related to ethics and mm. the ethics related to your your country and the legal requirements of your country so if you are in south africa for instance you have to consider the poppy act if you are in europe you have to consider the gdpr and these are very important considerations because mm. if your design if your questions do not actually fundamentally align to ethical considerations then that can be a big problem yeah. Along with ethics is having a little bit of an intro, if you will, to the mm. survey that essentially says what your survey is about and provides the ethical details and the research details that are often required for respondents to know about before responding to your survey. So definitely bear those kinds of things in mind as early as possible in the research design so that you don't waste a lot of time reconsidering these things later on in your survey. I think those are really great points, Karen. And to go back to that idea of ethics, we want to make it clear mm -hmm. to survey participants that data will be managed securely. In mm -hmm. most cases, it will also be anonymized. And mm -hmm. so there's all these things that are there to protect our participants, but it also mm -hmm. makes them feel more confident and comfortable taking part in your survey. So Absolutely. don't overlook the importance of the anonymity or even the um, explanation of your research. You want to get mm. them excited to do your research. One thing to avoid though is an excessively long survey. I've been part of surveys before where you're on page 12 of 52 and you just mm. say, I, I have enough. So really try and aim to keep it short. The mm. general rule of thumb, and again, this is a general rule of thumb, is to aim for around 10 to 20 minutes. Um, there are some cases where you can do longer surveys, but it's important to make that then explicit and clear in that top page. Mm. For instance, say the average time expected to take is 15 to 20 minutes. That gives someone an idea of, okay, I don't have 20 minutes now. I'll come back to it later. Mm. Or maybe that they do have 20 minutes, but you don't want to get caught up with someone having 15 minutes through your survey and then have a meeting come up and not be mm. able to complete it. So it's an important point to keep in mind. We also want to use plain language that's easy to understand. This can be difficult when we're working with, you know, academic terms where we have jargon. And the best mm. way to address that is to avoid jargon first and foremost. But if you can't avoid it, give explanations of the term, give definitions. So if you're talking about intention to leave, you would say, this next section covers intention to leave, which is defined as X, Y, and Z. That means that the data you're collecting about intention to leave is mm. being answered correctly. And you can be cer certain that your participants are on the same page as you. We also want to create a bit of a logical flow in our questions as well. If you're looking at a Likert scale of questions that go from strongly disagree to strongly agree, it's generally useful to keep going with that pattern. You don't want to go from strongly agree being one, strongly disagree being five, to then being strongly disagree being one and strongly agree being five. Absolutely. It also <laughs> is important to keep in mind that there are other ones to use. So if you're not using strongly disagree or agree, but other forms of scale questions, try to keep the patterning the same because that's going to help people work through your survey without getting lost, confused, or frustrated for that matter. And you, you know, you, you at the end of the day have to analyze this data that they're all over the place. <laughs> you forgot point. the kinds of options that you're going to be using. Sometimes just having a logical flow means that you're going to get that data back in a form mm. that that's also easy and intuitive for you to analyze, which is not nothing. No. Um, <laughs> another thing to consider when it comes to your respondents is when you are compartmentalizing your, um, your, your questions into various pages, for instance, if it is an on online survey, try to give them some headings and maybe some mm. clear indication as to how far they are in the survey so that yes. they get a bit of momentum <laughs> and stay on it right through to the end. Not a bad idea. And also keep it professional. So keep 
as much as you want to avoid jargon and use plain language, make sure that the grammar is appropriate and the spelling is appropriate because you don't want the respondent or the participant to think that you know that your, your survey is a bit unprofessional. If you have some doubts around uh, around that, consider using Grammarly, consider mm. using a friend, consider using us to just help you, um, you know, uh, fix up some of those language issues that might be a little bit confusing or, or might distract from the mm. overall responses that they provide. Fundamentally, you want to make this easy. So consider mm. using a provider that helps you make it easy. If, in, in other words, something like SurveyMonkey, Qualtrics, Google Forms. These might be determined by the ethics considerations mm. of your country. But generally speaking, these kinds of platforms and providers allow your your survey to be mobile friendly to be easy to mm. see and read and answer and use and you want to make it easy for your respondents so consider using one of those providers if possible i mean i'll also add to that some of these providers they do have paid options and free options but mm. they can also help you getting that data out of the mm. survey and into a usable format so do keep Absolutely. that in mind as well so our second mistake that frequently comes up in survey designs is using poorly constructed or considered questions or statements. Karen, what can you tell us about this? How can we avoid these pitfalls? Yes, absolutely. Um, we've all read surveys where we thought, oh, that's a strange question. <laughs> I have no idea how to answer that question. And I think they generally fall into sort of maybe four broad categories. Um, mm -hmm. The first is, the loaded question where you know you've got where the question has a sort of a part of it that makes you seem oh well, like I actually wouldn't know how to answer that because it's almost implying that they already know an aspect of your answer so something like where's your favorite place to eat steak assumes that none of your respondents are vegan, for instance, <laughs> and that weren't you know that they, they wouldn't know how to answer that question and they'd probably just select the answer that has the best vegan options. <laughs> so, I mean, that will be terrible for your, for your own research. So you want to avoid anything that where you're making a couple of assumptions around the person answering your question. Uh, the second kind of question is very similar, and that would be um, sort of a, a the, the leading question. So a question yeah. that, you know, that is trying to sort of persuade your respondent to answer in a certain way. So it's something like, mm -hmm. how would you rate our excellent service here at grad coach would, <laughs> would be a little bit a little bit 10 out of, 10. <laughs> yeah, of course and um but you want to kind of avoid that because you are kind of leading them on and to be honest mm. they might actually get a little bit annoyed by that kind of question so they might actually you know just try to uh wind up you by saying oh terrible so you want to avoid anything that sort of annoys them a little um then the sort of third group of question will be something that's a bit double barreled where there's almost two questions in the one question and they kind of don't know how to answer both mm. so um, so something like, uh, do you enjoy peanut butter and Marmite on your bread? Or do you enjoy uh, eating broccoli and cauliflower? Then, of course, sometimes they might enjoy one. They might not love the other as much. And as a result, they'll kind of either not answer or they'll only answer for mm -hmm. one. And so you want to avoid anything like that. Um, and the fourth group of poorly structured or considered questions, I would say, is the vague question mm -hmm. the question that kind of isn't really asking anything or is a little bit too open and um and that can really fit into quite a number of areas sometimes you want a little bit of an open question mm -hmm. you do want to have a question around can you describe your experience around some issue mm -hmm. or something and you do want a little bit of an open-ended question because perhaps you've given them a little bit of a free-form writing style mm -hmm. option to provide that answer um i've got a few opinions about this <laughs> <laughs> firstly try to make sure that any kind of open-ended question that you ask is very important for your research mm -hmm. because you want to be very considered in why you're asking an open question why you're asking a vague question you want to be purposeful about it but the reality is is if you ask a vague question you might get a vague answer mm -hmm. so can you describe your experience about an issue is for a survey somebody might 
answer good. And if you're happy with the goods, then that's fine. But then you might have been, you know, you might have just given them the options to answer good. So my my instinct for a survey, generally speaking, is avoid as many free flowing or vague questions as possible because you do really, really want to make sure that the questions are specific mm -hmm. so that you get specific answers from your respondents. Um, and, and this will be different for say an interview where you want, mm -hmm. where you have an opportunity to engage a bit more with the respondent. You won't have that luxury with a survey and you will get respondents who will answer, will just skip the answer. They won't know how to answer. They'll mm. answer any which way that has absolutely nothing to do with any of the questions that, that you previously asked. And so rather avoid them if at all possible. I think that's a super good point, Karen. I've seen it many times as well, where you ask a question, you think it's going what one direction. You've clearly set the context and someone is talking about <laughs> quinoa when you're asking about steak. And so there's definitely an issue there. So I think exactly. an important thing to keep in mind is for every question you ask, think about what it is that you're trying to find out and how it feeds into your research questions, your aims and your objectives. Remember, we always wanna be coming back to that core golden thread. The other thing to consider is, is it creating data that you can analyze? So for instance, the open free form questions are a lot more difficult to analyze. You're going to have to break down that string of words into something that is meaningful and quantifiable for a survey. So do keep that in mind when designing your questions. You want to make sure that there is a, a clear focus and a clear point to each Absolutely. question as well. Another thing, and particularly to avoid the quinoa st steak issue, <laughs> is it's always worth piloting your study. And what I mean mm. by piloting your study is giving it out to one or two people that you know that you can then follow up with afterwards. Have them run through the survey and then work through it with them afterwards and say, how did you understand this question? Were mm. there any questions that weren't clear? I see you mentioned quinoa when we were asking about steak. Why is that the case? Oh, all right, you're vegan. That means that I need to include a vegan excluder at the start. Mm. So having this sort of trial run is really going to help you identify quite a few of the potential issues as well. What mm. I'll also say is a good pilot where you do, you know, five to 10% of your total sample gives you a bit of data that you can do preliminary analysis on. So you mm. can get an idea of what is the patterns that we might see. And that can be helpful as you are doing reading because it's never great to be sitting still doing nothing while your survey is running for the next two <laughs> to three weeks. So I like to do that because it gives me something to work on or at least something to read up on. So our third frequent mistake actually links to our previous mistake and that's using inappropriate response types or options. So Karen, how can we use these types of questions we have available to best answer the issues in our survey? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's quite common to see people uh, have inappropriate types of uh, mm. responses that people should be selecting or you know, writing for mm. when they might not have considered perhaps some of the nuances that people might, you mm. know, might be thinking about when responding. Uh, so for instance, thinking about having an appropriate response might be something like, should I give a yes, no option? Should I give a scale option of sorts where I have, you know, one to five or strongly disagree to agree? What should I do? And so I think to sort of break this down, it's good to think of three common kinds of questions that you might, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, or kinds of answers that you might put into your, um, into your survey. The first yeah type or kind of answer or response type would be that of categorical uh, information. So mm. something like, um, you know, an option of yes or no could be considered somewhat yeah. categorical. You could also have various options like what continent do you currently reside in where your options are Antarctica and Australia <laughs> and Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just, a, you know, where somebody will select one option 
out of a bunch of options that you know you provide and so that is under the guise of or under the umbrella of categorical responses or categorical types of answers uh, the second common type of response is that of scales or and especially like it scales mm -hmm. and that goes back once again to that strongly disagree to strongly agree set of options where technically you as the researcher could create a scale of those options by having mm -hmm. one as strongly disagree and five as strongly agree now there are issues with that particular kind of response in the sense that it's very common for people to have too few options. Mm. So maybe they'll only have three where strongly disagree is one and strongly agree is three, but sometimes people don't feel so strongly about mm. the option. So, I mean, then they send it sort of just tick neutral just in case. Um, and then of course you get too many options. So if you have a sort of a, what they call a 10 point like it scale then people sort of just respond a little bit willy-nilly and what you as mm. the researcher find out a little bit later is that nobody answered eight for anything <laughs> that mm. can be a little bit you know uh you know tricky to deal with uh when it comes to the statistics a little bit later the third kind of uh question or response type is that that i've already mentioned that sort of open-ended question mm -hmm. and um and i know i was quite harsh of saying you know don't have too many of them but you really do want to make sure that what what open-ended questions you have is very purposeful and well considered and quite often it's typical to want an open-ended a question um, with a free flowing freestyle option answer because you really want to get some of that nuances and you as the researcher are excited to see what people are going to say but quite often many people just won't answer that or it's, it's just too time consuming however there are certain kinds of respondents who will respond to that and who will want to have their say and who mm -hmm. might have some issues with the kinds of questions that you've asked previously and if you feel that your respondents might want to tell you a bit more information, then definitely go for it. But bear in mind that you don't want too many of those. Mm -hmm. A good example of, a, of, of my own research where I found people were very happy to respond and wanted to say their piece was when I surveyed teachers around COVID. Mm -hmm. They really were feeling desperate and they wanted to say what they wanted to say and it was really, really beautiful to read their responses but nine times out of ten people don't answer that and so you want to sort of be mindful of your response your respondents time and their capacity to answer those kinds mm. of questions so fundamentally what you really want to do is you want to be thoughtful about the kinds of response types that you are providing for your respondent in your survey make sure that the response type that you put in is appropriate both for them that it's easy for them to provide an answer but you also want to bear in mind fundamentally that you as the researcher have to now sift through all this data <laughs> and if you do not have a response type that um, is relatively intuitive or simple or straightforward to to actually use in your analysis then you kind of would be shooting yourself in the foot of it so definitely there's no wrong you know response type for every question but the response type that you put in has to be appropriate for the question mm. that you're asking for the respondent that you have in mind and for you as the researcher when it comes to analyzing your data a little bit later i think those are great points and it's definitely something i've done as well where i <laughs> thought this is an excellent question it's totally great put it in, got the data, and then went, oh my goodness, what do I do with this? How do I analyze that statistic? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, to provide an example is, for instance, questions that allow respondents to have multiple answers. You know, mm -hmm. this comes into how many of these statements do you agree with or something mm -hmm. along that line. They're really nice from a descriptive perspective because then you can identify sort of what is the proportion of representation mm -hmm. for any of these options. Absolutely. The problem is if you want to do any sort of inferential statistics or comparisons, it's a nightmare. So <laughs> yeah, do keep yes. that in mind when you're working on questions. Think about how you're going to analyze them. For instance, if you're looking at your categorical questions, they limit you in the statistical 
um, analyses that you can run. I think it's also worth noting that you want to use a variety of responses. It's very mm -hmm. easy to think, okay, I know how to analyze Likert scale data. So I'm just going to have all Likert scale questions. And then I'm going to have my two demographics and that's my survey. The problem with that is you do limit some of what you can handle. Um, you also yes. are pigeonholing yourself into a specific place. Yes. Sometimes it's nice to have that categorical variable where you can compare, for instance, a scale like how, how much do you perceive your stress between those with children and those without children or systems like that. So it's important to keep that very variety from an analysis perspective, but also from your survey perspective. People get a little tired when they're just seeing the 17th page of <laughs> how much do you agree with these statements. So keep mm. that in mind. So our fourth common mistake that comes up in survey design is using poorly designed scales or measures. Now, Karen, this is quite a big issue sometimes. Can you tell us what we can do to avoid it? And probably more importantly, what am I even talking about? <laughs> Absolutely. I can definitely help out with that. So we've spoken before about the design of the survey as a whole, but mm -hmm. fundamentally those, those constructs, those ideas, those individual ideas that you're wanting to measure, quite often, not always, quite often they're measured using those Likert scales that we talked about earlier. And mm -hmm. you really want to consider those carefully. For instance, the first thing to consider is that if you are measuring a construct like job satisfaction, my favorite apparently, mm. uh, you cannot have one question for that. Primarily because there's quite often a lot of nuances around mm. a big construct that need to be unpacked a bit. And quite often, if you ask people, rate your you know, level of job satisfaction, it means that you have to make sure that they know what it is and that they have the same idea mm. about job satisfaction as you do. And so it's a little bit difficult to do that with just one question. So quite often what you see in academic research is that one construct will have more than one item or question associated with it. And that is very, very important because that allows you as the researcher to do further tests to make sure that your survey and the constructs that are being measured are valid and reliable. And by that, I essentially mean that in terms of validity, that the things that are being measured or asked about in your survey actually are measuring the thing that you're talking about in your literature review and in your mm. research question. So are those things, academically speaking, theoretically speaking, actually being measured by the questions in your survey? And the second thing to consider when it comes to validity is, are the interpretations of these questions mm. from the point of view of your respondents, are those interpretations appropriate given your definition of the original construct or the original idea? And it's a little bit of a roundabout way of thinking, but there are a lot of ways to measure this. And we're not going to go into that too much today, but fundamentally it's easier to measure it if you have more than one item, ideally actually more than four or five or six items. And the more items mm. you have or the more questions you have, sorry if I'm using items when I should be using questions for this video, but um, the more you have, the better it is to sort of tease apart how valid your, um, your, your survey is for what you're trying to measure. The second thing that's worthwhile bearing in mind is uh, reliability. Mm -hmm. And reliability is essentially a way of measuring how frequently or how often people give the same response to the same kind of question. And so what you tend to have is multiple ways and multiple think ways of thinking about reliability, or also multiple ways of thinking about validity, but multiple ways of thinking about reliability include, will somebody answer the same question the same way, maybe a couple of weeks from now, mm. maybe later on in the day, maybe after an argument with their spouse. And also, um, <laughs> are they likely to answer all of the questions related to a single construct or a single idea mm. in a similar pattern or a similar way, if you will, uh, throughout the survey. And so those two things are fundamentally important 
important and 100% expected from you if you're wanting mm. to publish your research at some point, but also if you're just wanting to get your survey, um, you know, through through the reviewers and through the examiners um, mm. at some point. So bear that in mind as early as possible when designing your survey, otherwise you could uh, run into some problems. Basically, if you are designing your own survey from scratch, then you have to provide some level of assurance that your survey is valid and reliable. Mm. This can be done in a number of ways. And as I said before, we're not going to go into too much detail of it, um, of how to do it. But there are statistical ways to do it. And there are just sort of practical ways of doing it as well, mm. um, such as, you know, um, asking experts whether these questions make sense, given, you know, the kinds of questions that uh, and the kinds of constructs you're trying to measure. But bear in mind that validity and reliability are core to making sure that your survey is actually doing what it's meant to do. I think those are really great points. I will just mention don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. There yeah, definitely are don't. <laughs> so many scales, so many um, systems out there already. So, for instance, if you want to measure stress, there are a ton. Mm. We always mm. mention the PSS. It's a scale that almost everyone uses. Similarly, mm. there's job satisfaction scales. There's well-being scales. And it's mm. really better to use a scale that's been designed, published, and proven to be reliable and mm. valid. 100%. Often enough, it's even better if you can show that it was proven reliable and valid when it was created. And then subsequent studies have since used the same scale effectively. Mm. It is also possible that maybe there isn't the exact scale that you want, but in your field, maybe you're working in the engineering um, industry and you want to be looking at sort of job safety. There might not be an engineering specific job safety scale, mm. but there might be a manufacturing specific job scale. And mm. often enough, you can then modify that and rely somewhat on the reliability and validity of the scale from its original source. You will still have to confirm it's valid and reliable, but it's going to be a lot easier because you're working from a proven recipe, so to speak. So I Absolutely. think that's really an important thing to keep in mind. Don't make more work for yourself. It's perfectly normal. And I will say many, many researchers never create their own scales. They mm. use scales that have been existed already in new contexts and in new ways. So mm. don't feel that you're you know, skipping out by using a previous scale. And then similarly as well, I've mentioned this before, but it's a, a point I like to come back to is run that pilot study then yes. you can look at if the scale is reliable particularly mm. if you're creating your own scale you want to be running the survey on a small scale assessing the validity and reliability before sending it out to your full thousand people because otherwise you might end up having an unreliable scale and you've just mm. used all your time to get all these responses mm. it's important to pilot it confirm before moving forward and that's just really to protect yourself moving forward and to optimize your time usage as you work through this all right so our fifth and final mistake that often comes up in surveys is really not considering how you're going to analyze the data now karen and i we've been touching on this a bit but karen this is your chance to really dive into it what can we do to make sure that we are planning accordingly for our analysis Yes, I, this is probably one of the biggest things, you know, to think about is that fundamentally, at the end of the day, whatever data you get, <laughs> you have to do something with it. Mm. And um, it's a really good idea to know kind of what you want to do. Um, of course, we all have varying levels of statistical expertise. I know for my re for my graduate school years, that was something I had to catch up on quite dramatically. And for yes. a lot of people, that is something that they have to do. Um, but generally speaking, even just having a, a relatively, um, you know, plain idea around something that you that you're wanting to do with this data, like I'm going to compare this variable with this variable, this variable is categorical, and this variable is going to be a scale of sorts. Just knowing that kind of level of detail can be very, very helpful. 
especially when it comes to what kinds of options you're going to be providing for your respondents, when it comes to how many questions you have and how many questions relate to which construct, all of those kinds of details actually really come down to how much are you actually planning on doing? <laughs> At the end of the day, it's just absolutely impossible to do statistics comparing a hundred different questions to each other. Um, it's just way too much work and quite often a lot of things get lost uh, while you do it. So try to keep it relatively plain in terms of what exactly you're wanting to do, even if you don't quite know which statistical analysis specifically you're going to be using. Another good reason why this is important to know is especially when you provide some options, when it comes to remember those categorical uh, you know, yeah. options that you might have, what you tend to do is you try to put all of the different options down. And quite often at the end of the day, if you're asking somebody, you know, which country are you from, you're probably not going to actually be able to analyze it country to country to country if you only have mm -hmm. 200 respondents, because there'll be some people from, you know, a country Colombia and you only get two from Colombia and that doesn't really give you any statistical information really because you only have a small sample size for that particular category. So mm -hmm. being thoughtful about what you're trying to get out of it and how you're going to use it, whether you're going to use it descriptively, whether you're going to compare each variable to each other is very, very crucial at the end of the day. If you do have some issues with respect to maybe your panicking around how you're going to be analyzing it, then it's really good idea to get some help. This can be in the form of, you know, asking, you know, your statistically minded friends. It could be in the form of coming to grad coach if you know you're so inclined. Um, but generally speaking, it is a really good idea to bounce some of these ideas uh, mm. off of somebody just so that you've got a good sense of what is fundamentally achievable at the end of the day with the data that you're planning on collecting. Otherwise, you might run into a few issues when it comes to the actual analysis side of things. I think that's really great points, Karen. And it's important to note as well, it's best to do this right at the start while you're designing mm -hmm. the survey. It happens very often, um, particularly in our line of work, where someone will come mm -hmm. and say, this is the survey that I have, and I'm, mm. these are my research questions. And when there's a disconnect there, it makes the analysis extremely difficult. Absolutely. It's also worth noting, and this relates to your research questions as well, try not to tackle too much with your mm. survey. If you're trying to compare seven scales to another eight different scales, that becomes mm. extremely unwieldy and you lose the focus of your paper or thesis. Really, Absolutely. we want to make sure we're accurately answering those research questions. So I always tell my clients mm. and anyone I work with, look at that golden thread. What am I seeking to answer? What information mm. will I need to answer that? And mm. what comparisons will I need to do to prove that? Mm. It's also worth noting, maybe you're not doing a quantitative inferential study, you're just doing descriptive analyses, it's still important to keep this in mind. If you Absolutely. have a hundred questions and you need to work through each one of those hundred questions separately, that's going to be a lot of analysis to do. And then that makes your results section really full, if you would. Mm. So keep that in mind. Always think what is the end goal and work your way backwards. And that's really mm. the important part at any stage of research, but particularly when you're talking about how you're collecting data. Mm. All right. So Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great having you and we appreciate the insights. Thank you, David. It was great being here. All right. So that pretty much wraps up this episode of Grad Coach TV. Remember, for more information about surveys, consider checking out our blog at gradcoach.com forward slash blog. There you can also get access to our dissertation and thesis writing mini course, which gives you all the basics you need to get started on your research journey. Also, if you're looking for a helping hand with your dissertation, thesis or research project, be sure to check out our one-on-one -on -one private coaching service, where you can work with one of our friendly coaches, just like Karen. For more information and to book a free consultation, head over to gradcoach.com. So that's it for today. Until next time, good luck.